If your websites conduct transactions or collect sensitive data, you have a material risk on your hands that could cost millions. The client-side security gap is being exploited daily with attacks like digital skimming, credential harvesting, and form jacking. 98% of sites use first and third-party JavaScript to power and enhance the user experience, opening up the client side to the adversary. Unlike most things in security, there is an easy fix. Start by understanding your risk. Let Source Defense give you a site-wide risk report this week. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash source defense. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. I have announcements and stuff, which I forgot to advance my teleprompter. So I don't actually know what those are. Unless I do. Wait. No, I do. Yes. If you have a guest or a topic you'd like to suggest for one of the upcoming shows, you can do that by going to securityweekly.com forward slash guests. We review those pretty much every week uh, on our weekly call, and uh, we'll do that. And uh, if you get approved or you don't get approved or whatever, we'll let you know. Either way, securityweekly.com forward slash guests. On to the news for this week. Since we have Tom on the show, oh, we should talk about laws. Laws. There's, well, this isn't actually we should. A, this isn't actually a law yet or a, uh, an act that has passed, but uh, the House has passed in Industrial Control System Cybersecurity Training Act. Uh, so CISA will be the benefactor of said act and will, I, I think, receive... I don't know if it's a mandate or if there's money tied to it. I didn't read if they would be getting additional funding. I didn't read the act. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not sure if funding comes with this, but they will be uh, uh, able to create virtual and in-person training courses uh, provided at no cost to participants, which almost kind of implies they're going to need funding. Probably uh, grant, to grant, do money. The grant Probably money. Grant yeah. money. These training courses will be, be available for different skill levels, including introductory levels. It's called out in, in the act. Training course and courses that cover cybersecurity defense strategies for industrial control systems, including an understanding of unique cybersecurity threats facing industrial control systems. That's pretty cool. Get it called out. I like, bet you right there. I bet you Dragos is going to get uh, that contract for the training, and and I would be totally cool with that. They're amazing people, and they 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 know more than just about anybody else. Right. That's, I was thinking of Rob, and he's he's going like this right now. Like, hey, he's like, I can I can do that, right? That's exactly who I was, that's exactly what I was thinking of. I'm like, who better? To Hell, do that? the cartoons he's been doing, you could probably just use those as a training course. Yeah. Now this still has to go through, right? The Senate gets signed by the president. Correct. They get that right. Yes. It has to be signed into law. Yeah, it has to be signed into law. Um, but it has house passed by the House, which which is pretty cool. Is it, it going to the Senate? Uh, it didn't say where it said it passed the house well it probably has to go to the senate and it has to it, go to the senate right so by it once it passes the house it automatically goes to the senate floor mm -hmm. correct they, they reconcile the bill and then but, it goes to the president but in the senate do they create committees to review it or is that just in the house or both they do it both they do it they both, both right absolutely okay. yeah yeah, yeah. So this will go through further scrutiny and could get changed right before it lands. Oh, it'll, it it'll, does, yeah, it, it most almost certainly. always does. But right? I mean, it, it, it this makes, one still doesn't seem that it complicated. Makes a lot of right? sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, right. it's, it doesn't sound very controversial. It's money for training to protect our critical infrastructure, right. which I think of all the, of all the laws, especially we were, talk, we were talking on the break about laws. They don't all make sense to us. This one makes pretty good sense, especially <laughs> what happened in in Texas in uh, on the twenty third. Allegedly, mm -hmm. uh, the. Uh, with it, with it, Triton malware. Mm -hmm. uh, again, FBI always, whenever there is a oh, attack, there was a recent attack that they, in Texas. But, but they're saying that it wasn't. Now they're coming. But originally, the FBI said it has all the hallmarks of, of the Russian of hackers. Russian hackers, and the the company was saying no, no. It, it was not. And then I think cybersecurity professionals and others were like, wait. How hard did you look? Well, that's the other thing. Did you they, look in the right places? Did they, did they have the the actual? Uh, system in place to really follow it and to, to see Correct. really where it came from and that's Correct. that's the question right now they're trying to answer you know we were we were talking about this in the context of firmware security which which applies here because we talked last week about four scouts research and looking in ot systems and you know i do firmware security is is my full-time job <laughs> working for eclipsium so i attend up talking about it a, a lot with a lot of really smart people uh about firmware security and we're talking about like if you don't look in the firmware to see if it's been compromised, 
how do you know if it wasn't a firmware based attack so in this case hypothetically speaking because we don't have the details of this case right if the attackers did embed themselves in the firmware and no one was really looking there to say is this system and or device running firmware from the manufacturer or has it been tampered with like there's a very specific process to do that if the response folks and forensics folks and security folks aren't doing that analysis how how do you know if you're not looking and that's kind of what we're saying about this yeah. whole story i'm going to take well, it what, away what from firmware security firmware for a moment i don't want this to be a firmware security show but you know take that away if they're not looking in other areas or tom to your point if they didn't have logging in certain areas how would they know how can they say with any definitive proof that it wasn't and, they, and, and it bothers me that the fbi automatically jumped to that conclusion without going through that process correct just to find correct. out and, and it's it, mm. it's almost almost sounds political mm. the way they did it but i, I ask my question as, as a as a neophyte why is there a reason why these critical infrastructures like this either a, uh, a gas company whatever don't have uh closed systems where oh, God. how much time you got tom uh, so, <laughs> I mean, to me, I mean, as, as a layperson, right, I would think that would be like the answer to a lot of these issues is to, you know, barrier off these types of attacks. I think, like, if I were to sum it up, it would be that security versus convenience factor, right? That connectivity and technology breeds some sort of convenience that you have to push aside security to gain that convenience. We'll give you an example. I'll give you a real, real world it's, example. It's a the water, the water plant attacks in Florida were Team Viewer, right? Team Viewer's mm -hmm. remote access software that was set up so other people could have the convenience of remotely managing and monitoring those systems. However, it wasn't secured properly, and just that connectivity by itself, without even any additional security controls, uh, in and of itself, is a security vulnerability. I think that's the kind of like I, I, basic. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Actually, Tyler, that, I mean, so, let me, hold on, let me Tyler, paraphrase. Tyler. Tyler, go ahead. Tyler's the, been trying to play. The big, thing, the big thing with ICS is you have to remember that even though, yes, they should be a closed loop system, they should follow the Purdue model, they should have all these systems kind of air gapped. The interoperability and the complexity in which we've set this up where you have multiple companies bidding on certain energy prices, they have to have the ability of real-time production, they've got things like black star generators that have to queue up on a, an instant based on grid load and availability, all of those things interoperable and have to talk in real time, which means those connections have to be available across the internet, not just the ability to maintain and operate them. You've got the business aspect of uh, commodities and energy pricing, but you also have the availability and operability of those providing services on a real-time system that is also you know, always up and potentially has legacy and uh, real-time operating systems that have to interact on legacy protocols. So all of those things kind of play into that particular piece that is not always thought about. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, where else do you guys want to go? Man, there's there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot to unpack this week, man. I'll, you know what? Yeah. I, I want to I jump to my favorite story this week. Uh -oh. Um, straight to it, huh? Straight to wh which one you think was my favorite, Tyler? I'll let you. Uh, I'm gonna go with destructive firmware attacks, a posse of significant threat to businesses. Uh, that wasn't my favorite. Well. It could be my favorite for very selfish reasons of my day job, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Like, hey, thanks, HP. Self-promoting evangelist. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> I, I, but it was a survey, right? And everyone knows my feelings on, on surveys. Now, this survey actually helps to promote firmware security. So it's hard for me to have an unbiased opinion here. Like, I'm just going to throw this out to the listeners. It's super hard for me to have an unbiased opinion. Like, HP did a survey and, like, I don't know if it's how they structured the survey because it's different from when I talk to people as you know, just starting at Eclipsium. Like I've talked to people at firmware security and I can tell you like my own scientific um, impression is that, you know, many folks are like, I, I got so much on my plate. I can't think about firmware security or like, I, I don't know what we're doing about firmware security. Like it's hard and there's an operational risk to updating new firmware. So like I'm scared and I don't understand the threats. And then you start looking at the technology and you talk about, you know, all the acronym soup and they're like, I, I don't understand the threats. I'm like, that's my impression. So HP does this survey and they're like, 83% of IT leaders say firmware attacks against laptops and PCs now pose 
a significant threat. While 76% said firmware attacks against printers pose a significant pose a significant threat. I'm like, really? Really? Like, how did you ask that question and get 76% of people to to say that? Because it doesn't say what the actual question was that they asked. So well, I'm, I'm very what I'm saying is they... there's selection bias here. And is that all is that also like bias in the way you ask the question? What do they call that? That's um that's a different thing. There's a word for that as well, right? There's like who you choose to ask the questions of for the survey and then there's how you ask the questions they can both be tuned to get the results right and i'm not saying hp did that but i'm also saying like they might have done that <laughs> maybe intentionally maybe uh, non-intentionally yeah you can like, do it unconsciously man bias is content spin and bias can be unconscious look as, as my job as a my title is a firmware security evangelist right for eclipsium and if 83 percent say that firmware attacks now pose a significant threat, like I I like my job's easy. And I'm telling you right now, like my job is not easy in that respect. So I think there was I think there was some bias there in, the, in this I think if survey. it was done by a university or some third party, I think it would have a little more credibility. I agree to I mean what I want to see is different organizations with different perspectives conducting a very similar survey and or research and then analyze those that those that collective work of research to draw a conclusion much like they do in many different you know areas of research and study right, right. so like i said i i some of the numbers i was like i, I think that's kind of that's a stretch especially think, you know with the questions that were asked i mean you don't correct. know how, how they were asked. correct though. um so more than two-thirds 67 percent of it leaders say protecting against detecting and recovering from firmware attacks has become more difficult and time consuming do increase in home working. Now, I agree with the first part of that. I think that it, it's on point, and I think largely people agree, right? Protecting against detecting and recovering from firmware attacks, or even just dealing with firmware in general, is more difficult and time consuming due to just the sheer number of devices that you're dealing with. And the fact, if you look under the covers in any laptop or modern PC, you've got potentially a dozen different types of firmware and or microcontrollers that are living inside of your systems and, and some of the, some of those high quality some of those not like you mm -hmm. you start yeah. to look at your laptops and you think about okay yeah i've got the latest intel chip i've got the latest tpm i'm doing really good updates and security on the ufei bios but that uh spi interface to the ic2 controller for my touchpad and my webcam is shit because they had to cut some corners somewhere. Yes. Like that's a thing. Or like you're running the latest U EFI BIOS, but the manufacturer stopped updating it. Right? Less yeah, well, less and common and more maybe, enterprise like enterprise gear. Like there are some manufacturers that I mean let's be frank, like Dell, HP, uh Lenovo that most enterprises use, they tend to be a little better. But you start what but I that's found, because of their supply chain deal, right? Correct. Paul, that's their supply chain correct. deal as a big manufacturer. That mm -hmm. goes secondary to the chip manufacturer. You talk about someone like AMI, AMI might not provide those BIOS updates to say Dell past the lifetime of whatever their warranty is. But you talk about a white box or even some of the lower end brands like an Acer you're not going to get that full support three-year firmware updates for the exact same AMI chip or exact same UFEI BIOS firmware as some of the bigger manufacturers that have those life cycle and time contracts in place. I mean, it could be even less time than that. And like, talk to me in upcoming segments about like updating the DBX, right? So if you've tried to enable secure boot, there's the certificates in, in that chain of trust sometimes those certificates need to be revoked and the dbx is the like, Wait, what, database you can revoke certificates in your bios yes yes <laughs> and if you're not Tyler. Getting, if you're not getting a uefi update it means that dbx isn't being updated which means you're not getting the re your revocation of those certificates that have been compromised by someone and that's super frustrating msi but that's people that are actually paying attention and realizing what certificates are compromised at that low level firmware, which is very few. And the people that are yeah. actually doing really good security, those are the ones you, you know, are thinking about, but may not be able to get as a consumer that is relying on that firmware for very sensitive information. Yeah. 
Uh, I think it was, uh, despite the clear risk that destructive firmware attacks pose to organizations, device security is not always a major consideration in the hardware procurement process. That's what leads to what Tyler and I were talking about. Like every manufacturer has basically customized a lot of this firmware, if not all of it, right? And put their own kind of spin on it, which means, and also enterprises don't always have everything's Lenovo, right? That's... I don't think there's a lot of, you know, even standardizing on, on one platform, I don't think is so much of a reality, right? So now you've got some HP servers here, you got some Dell laptops here, you got some Lenovo, and you can manage all that firm, but it's on like all these different platforms. And then like what's end of life, what isn't, and in which component it gets. Nobody's keeping track of that. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, unless you're an Eclipse customer. Yeah, just a soft. Play. I mean, unless you're working for a company that Paul's working for right <laughs> yes, now. Really that's what we do. Uh, that's one of the things we do, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was kind of interesting to see this <laughs> laid out like that. I think, to be fair, I kind of poo pooed some of the, you know, percentages in there as it's not being reality. But um, I, do, I do relate to the the difficulty in keeping up with all of this and some of the risks that we, we touched on, just some of them, right? That. It, much like IoT and some of the other firmware stuff we talk about, if you're not going to get new firmware, you're not getting any updates, and that can be pretty devastating. Well, it's it's always been a problem. It's just becoming <laughs> such a problem in the core technologies that we're relying on from all the way down to the hypervisor level that is providing the hypervisor to the cloud providers or right. SaaS applications. Like We're at a point where these these technologies are actually going to provide and need to be secured in order to ensure the integrity and accurate you know accountability of of the technology underlying that we have no choice now like this has been an issue like we know yeah, firmware has always been a problem on, but. on the cloud provider front i think they're adopting the google model that they did for search right i mean that was one of the things that made google what google is today they built their company on search but they had like their own hardware and software and I think the trend you're going to see is these major cloud providers are going to go, yeah, I'm not relying on anyone else. I want to get my own hardware. I want to put my own firmware on it. I'm going to write all of that, or I'm going to fork something that's open source, and we're going to maintain it. So you have to be your own. Basically, you shorten your supply chain. And for those really but super large. And, yeah. and validate the chips, like you cannot become a supply chain for some of those chips because of the things like rare earth metal acquisition and right, the ability to right. produce those chips and the firmware on those chips. There's, you know, intellectual property and uh, patent protection. Mm -hmm. So you still are relying on the integrity of the chips coming from, you know, wherever your supply chain is going in order to maintain that hardware. Mm hmm. You got uh, job security, Paul. It's okay. That's good. Uh, one of my <laughs> other favorite articles, and probably my favorite one this week, is called The Keys to the Kingdom. Um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read this. It, it's a that was lot. My second, that was my second choice. Yeah, it was a lot to unpack. Uh, Phil Vacon uh, is the author of this, um, who folks I work with uh, actually recognized uh, this particular person, uh, who I, I had not. Basically... Uh, Phil does a lot of firmware research, it sounds like, from the technical um, details in his article, certainly showed that. And it basically broke down to um, this interesting way. And so, like, basically, he was working with the client. Like, this isn't a hack, which is weird. Like, the client accidentally deleted their keys. Their cryptographic this keys. Is a use, this is a use case. This is a use case. They accidentally deleted their keys that were inside of the boot process, U EFI and the bootloader that provided essentially like secure boot. And it's not secure boot because it, it's not a I mean, this is, thing, right? But it's, it is uh, this is almost as bad. Yeah. This is almost as bad as like losing a USB with cryptographic flash keys. Kind of similar. You know, with cryptographic right. keys for cryptocurrency. So now this, I, this, pr this hardware software provider, right? Uh, manufacturer, can, <laughs> we want to push out an update but we can't because we basically locked ourselves out of our own firmware. So we because we don't have the key anymore that validates that the new firmware you want your new firmware should be signed with that key. And the bootloader goes, "Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll boot that stuff. Like that's cool because you know it, it, the keys the keys are all good." Um, so this Phil, this the researcher, basically figured out a way around that. Uh, and I thought I had my my quotes on how like I I 
I thought I distilled this down. Um, so basically, the uh, a signature check was performed only on the code region in the specified header. So I believe what he did was um, basically spoof that. So the headers match, but the payload was different. And inside of that payload, he could execute code. And then the code that he executed was to erase the original uh, public key and write a new one in its place and basically swap yeah. out the key. So we've the, basically the CR, exploited the a vulnerability in the secure boot <laughs> process that allowed him to swap out the key so they could securely boot a new operating system. Which is, this, is, this is hardware specific. To be, to be clear, this correct. is very hardware specific. Like this is using UART, which is similar to JTAG or SPI. It's, right, it's low-level right. hardware interaction between uh, IOs, but... It is very similar where you're doing a CRC check, but the CRC check is only against the headers and the values being applied on the memory that is actually executing the initialization code and not the actual payload after the initialization is happening. This is very Correct. similar to things that use um, memory shimming in order to bypass authentication in Windows. It is allowing the boot process to happen and at either adding a cert or adding code on the end of that cert in order to shim the memory to a specific location as it's booting so that process happens after the fact of the validation uh, the check happens. Right. Yes. Right. I was pretty slick. It's, it's, a good re it's a good read. It's really cool how we did it with the mm -hmm. UART. Like, I've not seen yes. anybody mess with UART in that way. <clears throat> it's pretty wild. Oh, and we forgot to talk about Joe Grant's video, too. Oh, yeah. That was amazing. That was fun. That was... Um, so I he does a good job, like, keeping you on your seat. Like, whoever yes. his video guy is. He like, hired, just... Yeah, he had a friend. I, I spoke with Joe, and he had a friend um, that runs a production company that is doing these videos for him. And Joe is basically helping people recover their cryptocurrency from devices they've been locked out of. Oh. And the most recent case... so. Go to Joe Grand's YouTube channel. I forget if you search Joe Grand YouTube, like you'll you'll find it. It's it wasn't hard to find. Uh, his most recent video. He has a production company, basically following him around. He's like he met this person, and this person was like, "I got locked out of my Samsung phone, and my Samsung phone from like back in the day, like micro USB, like a, a swipe pattern to unlock it, like the old school kind of. It was an older phone, and he's like, there's some cryptocurrency on there." He's like, and I, I think it's like six million dollars worth of cryptocurrency that's on the phone. <laughs> and Joe's like, Don't all right, spoil it, Paul. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna spoil it. The, the, so the video says like unlocking a, a wallet with six hundred or a phone that has a wallet that has six million dollars worth of cryptocurrency on it, right? And so um, Joe meets this person in a, a hotel room, and the guy actually says, he's like, yeah, I reached out to like a bunch of people, and. He's like, some people were like, oh, yeah, just send me the phone. It's like, I'm not <laughs> sending you the phone. Like, what are you, insane? And Joe was one of the few that were like, you can, you can meet me in, in a hotel in a mutual place. And he's like, I'll help you unlock the phone. Joe did a great job of explaining, like, the different options. And, like, obviously, when you're working with hardware, there's a risk that you can render the device inoperable or brick it right and then that crypto i mean it could be gone at that point right so they're like this is a risky operation and joe gets to this point where like his soldering skills are just unrivaled i'm like <laughs> that was i'm like joe that was amazing i, I think he was kind of like he was modest about it but what I want people to know, they're watching this video, and those of us that have, you know, they're into soldering and have done it, I, I suck at soldering, which is maybe why I have such an appreciation for Joe. Like, he had to solder these connection points that were really super close to each other. I mean, this is like micro soldering. And if the, con the hair. right, the contacts touch, it doesn't work. Right. So the contacts have to be, have to, there has to have space in between them. And I mean, <clears throat> Joe must have spent, in fact, like, the I think he said three hours the just. Yes. Yeah, the continuity between the solder actually matters and, and the ability for the signal to determine the modulation of a one or a zero based on, on the sin that's happening across that, that solder point. Like, I'm pretty good at soldering, and like that, I've done some phone soldering, and, and that was something I would never wish upon anybody. He did yeah. a phenomenal job, and it doesn't look great. No. But like, that was work. a phenomenal job for what it was. What do you charge for something like that? I mean, a guy got $6 he, million. He, he, does, he doesn't I would say. I would imagine 40%. He he created a company uh, to do it because he broke into a crypto. What was the name of the crypto wall that he? Trezor. 
Trezza. It was a Trezza. And that, that's how this guy found him because he saw the other video of Joe helping out someone else get into a different crypto wallet. It wasn't a phone. It was a, a Trezza wallet, a hardware wallet. And the guy was like, I think this guy Joe Grant can help me. <laughs> And Joe's been in our, I did a full in Joe's been in our industry like forever. Uh, he was part of one of the, uh, he was part of, we talked about the Loft group. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe's uh, was part of one of the original members of uh, Loft. Yeah. And so uh, I, go Guy check that video. Surgeon. I mean, tell you what, <laughs> yeah, whether you work in this field or not, that video was super cool, man. That was, that was a fun, fun watch. Um, Unlike that guy who had his uh, hard drive in the dump, he couldn't find it. He had like what forty million dollars of cryptocurrency. Yeah. There's someone else we know too that lost some USB devices with some cryptocurrency on it, and and still can't find it in Idaho and his vast amounts of property. Tyler, <laughs> 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 he's still looking for it too. Like the search Someday. will never end. It will never Someday. end. Someday. Uh Someday, Tyler's just going to come in like a really nice outfit and be the like, most yo. most expensive wow. I've ever bought. <laughs> yep. uh, implementing zero trust. Don't forget about printers. I, I don't want to downplay printer security necessarily. However, the article states, and I love, I mean, this, this could be a great article, but you know me. I love to just pick out like the one or two sentences and, and then just kind of riff on that. So unlike it says, unlike other IT systems, zero trust for printing primarily involves putting printers into a separate controlled environment or network and closely regulating and monitoring who has access to those printers. I'm arguing this is not zero trust. <laughs> this is not zero. This is what we call network segmentation. This is not zero <laughs> trust. This is not fight me on this. Is it new, is not is zero trust. VLANs are not zero <laughs> trust. Okay. Okay. Look, if your printers are your bastion hosts, you've got problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, that's a good T-shirt. I think I'm gonna call one. Printers are my bastion hosts. Right. <laughs> VLANs are not zero trust. That's another good T-shirt right there. I mean, you're not wrong. Like from a red team standpoint, like one of the. In fact, one of the, the most secure environments I've ever gotten into was leveraging printers and, and even VLAN segments. Like the things that get printed out on printers or scanned into printers or their ability to have access to other segments because of their need to be able to print. Even with good firewalls, everyone needs to print and everyone mm -hmm. does print and everyone does scan. And those IPs and ranges tend to get forgotten about and or managed like – Default passwords is still a thing on printers and multifunction devices. Managing large oh, default Wi-Fi SSIDs. Devices, yes. Like I pull passwords out of there. They get connected to Active Directory. The scan to folder thing or scan to printer share. All of those things have credentials on the printer. We can implant the printer. The printer has the ability to connect to the internet. You can put C2 up on a printer. Like the ways in which printers get abused is still an untouched market that people are not thinking about. And they always just say, oh, it's an MFA. It's a multifunction device. People are going to put them there. We don't manage them. They're provided by, you know, whatever our copy vendor is, and they don't have any control over them. That is how attackers get in, and that is where they maintain persistence. And I think you, you can't have a zero trust security model if you're not addressing the firmware security issues in, in well, that doesn't that doesn't even touch the firmware right paul like right. that's that's, that's but like that's printer, entirely... printers run printers run firmware right like i mean there are some there are some printers paul. with we're not even down at that level yet, Paul. We're talking about the fact that you drive by a company and you can pick up 17, you know, HP Wi-Fi SSIDs, okay, which have default passwords on them. You log into those, go to the printer, get admin on the printer in about, oh, I don't know, uh, three seconds, Tyler? Uh, and, and, and then you're in the printer, and then boom, you've got access to every single VLAN they've got or right. every department that printer is next to. You haven't really, even hit the firmware yet. It's not really segmented if it's broadcasting out Wi-Fi. Then you haven't really segmented your printer. Which is, I no, mean, no, it's it's segmented into the printer VLAN. I've had that told me. It's on the printer VLAN, therefore it's segmented. I'm like, it's got Wi-Fi and it's default in a, in, with default passwords on it. Well, that's only on the printer VLAN. What's the problem? How do people take, print? Take away, take away the Wi-Fi, though, and those printers are out in the public lobby. They're able to get mm -hmm. access into the coffee area. 
I can walk into any Fortune 100, and and I promise I will get in anywhere yeah. you have a printer. The data, the data, Wait, even better. But the data security model is broken, right? The printer trusts that you, the users, to operate on their data, to take their data, right? There's basically a two-way trust. That data is going to flow through the printer. If there's no CIA confidential integrity and um, availability, right, of those printers, like it falls, it falls down, right? There. You have to apply security to those printers, which one is segmentation. I'm not going to argue that's not a thing. They should be segmented, right? But you right. also have to harden them. I think, Josh, to your point with the Wi-Fi, like that's part of hardening and segmentation. And you have to secure them. The primary way you secure so, a printer, or at least one way, right, is securing the firmware, making sure it's up to date. On, and then you get down the rabbit hole of all the firmware things, because who replaces a printer? And printer manufacturers are going to stop supporting it, and therefore it's going to have vulnerabilities. And now you've lost all integrity of that printer and so, the data, the data that's being processed through them, which are print jobs. The data, the data that and and, and Tyler walks in, and Tyler walks in with a USB and goes, "Oh my God, I'm here to do a presentation, and I couldn't get it to print at home." You know, a uh, security mm -hmm. guard, would you mind just plugging in this USB and printing it? And they do, and they do. And they do, they and then Tyler's me. in. <laughs> oh yeah, the printer's over there. Just go up to the coffee shop on the third floor, and it's right next to the break room. Just go help yourself. Yeah. And the the protocols are not secure. I mean, those printer protocols. Oh yeah, I mean, you're, you're still you're still running very old, either LPT protocols over IP. Or you're leveraging some of the newer protocols, which aren't any better. Mm -mm. And most of those jobs are stored still in memory. So you're able to pull most of the recent scans, most of the recent prints. And that's a capability with inside the printer. That doesn't even get into the firmware and what's stored in memory. You can dump the memory and find additional stuff that's not even you know supposed to be obtainable. And, 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 and wait, wait, it gets better. Issues. It gets better. Remember, printers peaked in the 90s. Honestly, they did. The 90s and early 2000s. The best printers you'll ever find in your life were mm. made in the 90s. Okay? And Brother bought the old HP designs and repackaged HP designs in, with Black Brother cases, you know, and, and uh, whatever. And, and, and so the, uh, you, the old HP vulnerabilities are now back out in the world again. Mm. So it's like they never die. But they were the best. I mean, printers in the 90s, man. We had a Lexmark in the office. I think it was a workhorse. Workhorse. I had, we did so a lot. I mean, in the 90s, we did printing. a lot of printing. Everything was printing. Yeah, hell yeah. You used to print out emails and read them, right? Like, there was a lot of printing going on. <laughs> Those things would crank. I had Hewlett Packard 4SIs that had a million pages on them. Mm -hmm. And with a refit kit, which was like 300 bucks in the 90s, I could get easily another half a million pages out of them. Yep. And well, that is, I that did that. Even that doesn't even take into account time. some of the, the commercial printers. Like you talk about some of the the Micker printers or or even the oh, check geez. scanner printers that the major banks or processing centers ran. Like I used to work on those a lot, and there was 10, 10 technicians in the world that would manage those. Those things would do ten million sheets a month, easy. Like printing it's, printing it's checks, incredible. Yeah, printing checks yeah. and scanning checks all at the same time at. You know, a hundred thousand sheets uh, every minute or so. I like, think it's we have. Oh, oh, oh! I think oh, we Micker, had the magnetic, like... magnetic ink character recognition. Oh my god! Yeah, it's been Micker. so long since I thought about that. Oh. We had one that used yep, to print. The... Did universities used to print their own checks? Was that a thing? Yep. Yeah. Yep. They had the ink. Yep. They had the... the special cartridges that had yes. magnetic ink with inside of them. Micker printers. And those were very specific for the readers, so those would get printed, those would get sent to the bank, the bank would take them, either process them in the bank or send them to a processing center that actually have a magnetic scanner that imaged, scanned, printed out the ledger and transaction log, and pushed that through at 100,000 checks per minute. Like, it was incredible to see. Hmm. Super fast stuff, yeah, it was really cool stuff. Now, hiding in these devices is, is a thing, which segues into the other story. Uh, how APTs are achieving persistence through yeah. IoT, yeah. OT, and network devices. That may have been my favorite story. Right. Uh, but I want to I pick at this story a little bit. So when they get to the remediation, because to me it doesn't sit well. See, so the good news is that security at the device level is simple to achieve, which I don't agree with. While new vulnerabilities will constantly emerge, most of these security issues can be addressed through password, credential, and firmware management as well as through basic device hardening. 
Except Bullshit. When you, it, it, yeah. Okay. So I'm not the only one. Like, <laughs> except when you can't do any or all of those things because you can't change the password because either the manufacturer hasn't given you the facility to do so, or inside your right. firmware there's a backdoored password that was left there by a developer, and you can't easily grant you change that. I mean, unless you reverse engineer the firmware, pull apart, you know, pluck that string out, replace it with something else, recompile the firmware, and then re-image it, which. You could be JTAG, you know, soldering a header on or, you know, any other mechanism to get the firmware on and off that device. Um, so you might not be able to change the password. The device may not have authentication at all. Like just built into the device, you can't set a password. I gave an example, I think last week uh, of our HDMI uh, router. No password. Um, there's a web application vulnerability or 10 or 20 in that particular firmware that basically all bets are off. Attackers can get in through the web application. We've got thousands of examples, even just of documented CVEs of web applications that are within firmware-based devices. Or you can't update the firmware because it's no longer supported by the vendor and they stopped making the firmware. So like firmware management sounds great, but how, how do you manage firmware when the manufacturer goes, yeah, I'm not giving you any new on an, firmware. Like you're on, on your own. IoT if there's a vulnerability, costs, it's never going to get patched. Yeah, the IoT device that costs $25 that a manufacturer's incentive to create and maintain for consumer grade electronics being placed into small business enterprise or right. homes or or Cisco that's never going to happen. I mean, I want to pick on Cisco, or Cisco. but or Cisco because Cisco end, ends of life. To, and look, I'm not faulting like manufacturers have to draw a line in the sand how long they're going to yep. support. There's no incentive. The to. device. There's no incentive. I mean, they can't support every device forever. However, this impacts security greatly because it may wait, not wait. be a you cheap mean, twenty dollar camera. It might be a Cisco device, which could be router, switch, appliance, VP. It could be on any number of things. Cisco's like, yeah, do like we, we're there's no reason longer. there's maintenance agreements. Yep. You realize that the cost of all these low cost cameras and and IoT devices is that they've totally ignored the ongoing maintenance cost, right? And that's why they cost so little. And so what we're doing is we're accruing tech by debt. consumers to have the feature set at the cost in which they will purchase those devices, right? Like we've I, I agree we hundred percent. But could you could you create a company that's like, look, you've got end of life devices that have end of life firmware on them. Like we'll reverse engineer that firmware for you and we'll harden it and put it all back together and reflash your devices. <laughs> Hundred well, percent. Is that, is that cheaper? Is that cheaper than putting? Open WRT. But is that cheaper than? Is that cheaper than buying a new device and just replacing it? Perhaps. Usually not. Probably. I, so so I whoa, 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 whoa. But but here's the thing. There are companies that do similar ideas or open source projects or whatever. There's um, crap. There there's there's uh, Open WRT. There's correct. Uh, correct. Uh, the, yes. You know these kinds of projects. Uh, there there's a. Uh, there's an RTSP video camera system, but I can't think of the name of it. It's they kind charge. of like my argument for core, but core boot kind of falls in that same like realm for me is if the firmware is open sourced and it's being maintained by an open source project, they don't have that business driver that's like, we're not going to maintain updates for it. Like they'll maintain updates for it. I mean, until such time that they don't, right? Until such time they're like, open WRT, like we're no longer going to support. Getting, you're getting a, what you pay for, right? right. Like, open source is volunteer it is community it is like really smart people but there are times i get really busy and i'm not out you know breaking into some russian site because i don't have right. the time but like, i do think tyler that's that you've when you got have a time. if you're running open source firmware right and you find a vulnerability and you report it to that open source project the likelihood is they're probably going to fix it versus you go to big manufacturer cisco hp whatever and you go there's a vulnerability here and they're like, yeah, we don't support that device, so we're not going to produce a firmware update, right? Like, that's just going to be their standard stance. Uh, With we, open source, you might get you might get higher likelihood, in my opinion, you're going to get a fix for it. Are, are we assuming that these companies are buying these printers? They're not. They're leasing them. Most of the, most of these, I would imagine, a yeah, lot of these. Still lease, do we still lease? Leasing. Oh, so large, large, large expensive, the large lease. expensive printers. Were, they're leasing. They're leasing. Yes. Right. And, and, and no, 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 no. Most printers they're leasing yeah. because they don't have to support them anymore. I'm talking down At to desktops. Well, it depends on the lease well, contract. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not going to lease my Cisco appliance, am I? Yeah. Yes, absolutely yeah. you are. Maybe? I don't know. Well, I mean, Absolutely you places. are. There are companies that do nothing but leases. You, you, you can, I can call an MSP right now, 
and they will have an entire, I, I go, I've got an empty office. I need 20 desktops. I need five laptops. I need, you know, whatever I need to have internet to everything, blah, blah, blah. They're like, no problem. We'll push it through our leasing company. It'll be there on Monday or Tuesday because the Monday's the fourth. But and then I mean, your, lease that, run, like, your lease runs out and you just like a car, lease runs out, you go get a new one or whatever. You just ro- roll it over. You roll it over. And, exactly. And, and or you do the $1 or whatever. The full amount of the lease payment is deductible as mm-hmm. opposed to borrowing money to... Uh, to, to buy a, a, a piece okay. of equipment. Less of, a, less of a capital expense. It's right. Yeah. So, so you're and it. here's the kicker. Most of those leases end up with one dollar, like the, the computer is a dollar or whatever. So you're going to sell it to your employees who are like, oh, I can take my computer that I've worked on for three years home, you know, or four years home, and I can have it at home. You're and the employer employer's like, hey, no, my and now you can log in from home I if there's a computer. pandemic or something. Yeah. And now you've got unsupported computers right. with old firmware and old BIOS and 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 it's at the home of the employees instead of in the office. And that's what they're using to work from from home. Right. That's it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And, I, and that's how Tyler's going to break in. <laughs> Tyler, you said this. But hold house. on, Tyler, you said the story was one of your favorites, based on the title. I'm assuming that APTs are achieving persistence through IoT, OT, and network devices. And this is always something that I have. Uh, been almost an evangelist of sorts, right? To say that if I wanted to maintain persistence inside of an environment, I would go hide in the places on the devices that don't have a monitor, mouse, and keyboard, that don't have an interactive user, that don't support modern security stacks and software like endpoint security, and largely this class of devices. When I was talking about it, we talked about embedded devices. Now we talk about IoT, industrial IoT, OT, we talk about appliances, which have always been a thing as well. But that's where logically for me, I'm like, if I'm going to hide as an attacker, that's where I'm going to hide. Where no one else is really looking, right? And where a lot of, we'll talk about memory protections, right? Memory protections aren't there. The defenses against attacks against um, memory corruption aren't quite there when we talk about in, embedded devices. That's where I'm going to go as an attacker. Is that, was that why this yeah. interests you, Tyler, was that aspect? Yeah, I mean, this this has been botnet's big focus. This has been APT's big focus. Mm-hmm. Like, this has been the use case for APT since, you know, 2011, 2012. Like, we were leveraging vulnerable routers and, and wireless devices in order to bounce traffic between nodes. Like, you know, before Tor was a real big thing and before Tor actually worked and was was a great thing like we could leverage the ability to run in memory on a wireless iot device that sat at the isp level and you know you reboot that device there's no trace left of you so why go to all the trouble of compromising something that has huge risks when you can leverage things in an environment that are persistent have a great place and the capabilities and memory and processors now with inside of some of these lend yeah, themselves more, to very yeah. good toolkits. Yeah. Now that's a I have, that's an interesting question. When I was writing the book on WT fifty four G routers, I got a hold of one that had been compromised, and this is in like two thousand six when it was like not really well publicized at all. But I think the attackers did exactly what you described, Tyler. Is they just put stuff in memory. So as soon as that power source was removed. All evidence was gone. And I began theorizing at that time. I'm like, how would you dump the memory? And I don't remember where I left off. How do you dump the memory from a running embedded system or IoT or firmware-based device? How do you do that? If it's Linux, it's a file. Depen- do you, I mean, depends you just on your like access, a availability, gig. and if you are the owner and sole person on that device, and the ability for them to you maintain to something run. like a kernel yeah. root kit, a boot kit, or some yeah. persistent. you got to run software on that device while it's running. I mean, Linux, Linux root kits are a new emerging technology that is like the new threat that people didn't know about until recently. Oh, my God. <laughs> They've been a since... They've been a thing since. Dude, do you see the smirk on his face? (laughs) Do you see the smirk on his face? Seriously, though, do you see this? Like, it's an embedded technology, and nobody knows you. Like, do you see the smirk on that man's face? No, because what Tyler's referencing is that is being touted in the popular press and media today as like this new tactic. When in fact, there are kernel, there are kernel level rootkits that go back before Linux was even invented. Well, there were Unix kernels and BSD kernels Unix that people root wrote rootkits for, like for way Windows. back. I mean, you go back in Frack Magazine. I can guarantee you can pluck an article out of there that was talking about it before Linux was even even being developed. I'm I'm pretty sure I have a, a piece of paper that has some tear off 
pin thingies on the side of yes. it for those of you who are yes. really young. What do they call those? those were, uh, what, was the, what were those printers called with the uh, dot matrix? Dot matrix. Dot matrix, thank matrix. You. I dot matrix tractor feed. Yep. I still have one. <laughs> and what, what has a, a, a kernel level root kit for like AX on it or something? It's, I mean, it's a Lexar, man. You can't go wrong with those. Mm hmm. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. Um, all those stories kind of tied together. Oh, I want to talk about um, what does everyone think is the number one when Miter shared the 2022 CWE common weaknesses enumeration? Did I get that? Common weakness. What does the CWE stand for? Common weakness enumeration. I got it right. Top 25 most dangerous software weaknesses list. Um, um, you may have read the article, right? But like, what was number one? I don't know. Actually, I didn't. I didn't read this one. So number one is. It's going it, to be deserialization. Nope. Still the winner. Still the Access. winner. Out of bounds, right? AKA memory corruption. AKA buffer what? overflows. Yep. Number one by like a lot. So if you go read the article, they, they, so the rank number one, CWE 787 is called out of bounds, right? Which is memory corruption. I think is probably a more encompassing term. Buffer overflows. We, we call it right. Uh, has 64.2 in the score. The next one down improper neutralization of input during web page generation or cross site scripting is 45.97. And that's go to that's because all you, these hipster developers and kids have not learned their lessons from right? all the history lessons of making really bad code and having an oh, exploit. Talk about a history lesson. Click on the link for CWE 787 out of bounds right right description. The software writes data past the end or before the beginning of the intended buffer. Well said. Well said. Scroll all the way down. Like keep scrolling till you get observed examples. Right. Uh, no, not absurd. Keep scrolling. Keep scrolling. References. Aleph one smashing the stack for fun and profit. Nineteen ninety six. It goes back. To, oh my gosh! And you can dig even wow. further That's than like that. That's like bringing memories back. That is one of the references, right? Along with um, a lot of other great works, which we should read that that are on my my reading list that have been that have been published papers and or books. Um, that date far far back it's one of my my favorite things to do like we just we haven't learned how to protect against memory corruption still to this day it's still number one the good old-fashioned buffer overflow 1996 i mean it goes back further than further than that you can trace the history we were talking with joseph about history right that 90, would be 1996 you know, sounds so long ago, but it really was. I know, right? It's, it's, it, well, in computer and computer, computer security oh, times, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, an eternity, it's, right? Exactly. But, um, I think it would be interesting to write a, a book or pot, have some piece that traces back the history of the buffer overflow, right? Of memory corruption attacks. It would be super nerdy, but like, it's really, there's some like turning points, like the FRAC article. Was in 1996 was a turning point, right? Like there's been some interesting kind of, it's an interesting timeline. In a, in a problem, for it to be number one today that I think is really interesting to trace back, we really haven't solved. Obviously, if it's number one. I mean, according to MITRE in this particular case, right? And cross-site scripting is number two. I, but I think I, that's all the places that cross-site scripting can hide. That that one, I'll be a little more lenient with. It's a tough. It's a really tough problem because it, it just keeps one? manifesting itself. The second one was was a set, was cross-site scripting, but they they improper Still. improper neutralization of input during web page generation. How's that for a definition of cross-site scripting? I mean, that's kind of like that's kind of like some issues with deserialization or input like in, input sanitization you're, you're and on this deserialization right? thing sql injection that is where all the problems now stem from <laughs> sql injection was number three input validation four serialization where does it fall on here deserialization oh number 12 here's your note here's for oh you tyler shit, what deserialization of untrusted Wait, what? data 
is CWE 502 and it's number 12 on the ri- list. It's just after null pointer dereference for reference. What? Yep. Use after free is number seven. I mean, the hit the hits just keep on coming. Like we could. I and would, these are, it would be, like, so, it'd be these so much fun to do a whole podcast series and just dig into each one of these vulnerability classifications That's and then round it out with like ones that we can't, we struggle to classify. Like you, Tyler and Bo Bullock were talking about like uh, attacks against the blockchain that like we, we just haven't categorized today. To me, that was one of the most interesting things um, that you guys were talking about today was like there are just new classes of vulnerabilities. And that's that's super interesting too, but also kind of scary that we haven't solved the problem of these historical vulnerability classifications. Well, that's the sad part. Like, how do we address these new pieces and like get to the point where we're actually leveraging all these blinky light boxes and and bullshit billion dollar companies that are selling us stuff and utilize the technology oh. to fix the things that matter? And Tyler, we're still Tyler, Tyler, failing. that's the T-shirt. <laughs> blinky light boxes and billionaire and billion dollar bullshit companies. Mm. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. T-shirt, Tyler's T-shirts.com, soon to come. <laughs> soon to come. Not a lot of hard, hardware stuff on here. Like we were talking, was it last week about fault injection? That's it. There's an interesting, like, like it seems like to me that some of the hardware stuff wasn't on here. Uh, like timing attacks, the timing attacks make the list. I mean, in, in these were, there's no reference to timing uh, in, in this list. It's kind of interesting. Some of those more hardware based, you could almost yeah, have, a, have a top, top. I mean, it might be a top 10 or top 20 of hardware based attacks, branch prediction, timing, fault injection, right? Or some of the hardware ones we've, we've talked about recently, given, given some of the stories we've covered. All good stuff. Yeah, the hardware thing is, is kind of hard because you really get into the 0.01% of. One percent, like a lot of people understand hardware, they understand the interaction of hardware, but they understand it at the hardware level. You start to talk about the firmware or even the hardware to hardware level of interaction and the protocols and and you know relationships between chips and mm-hmm. and protocols. That is getting to the niche of people that really a know it and b care about it and three understand the security implications of it. You're down to yes, you know you're to a, a bar room full of uh, really good people <laughs> pretty much yeah pretty much I, and accurate. interestingly that's kind of the point of eclipsium paul's new company uh because the gap in knowledge yep. yes it is gap in knowledge for sure i mean this just understanding the boop it, which is interesting because I mean, we were talking about this i was talking with scott today like we're talking about how even with our backgrounds it, it wasn't until we like got to this point of, of talking with folks at Eclipse and working there and going, I didn't understand it worked that way, right? And that's pretty telling. I mean, Scott's got a deep background in security. Like I've taught classes on firmware reverse engineering and I've built computers. And when I started understanding like how the computer works from the point when you turn the, com- you know, press the power button until you see a login screen, like I didn't understand all that stuff that happens. I'm like, holy crap. And then like Tyler says to understand, like it's one thing to understand that. It's one thing to understand to be able to develop it, but it's yet a third thing to go, how do I break it? And then actually, I think a fourth thing is how do I actually implement those attacks, right? At that, those really low levels is really, it's kind of frightening how it doesn't make top 25 list like this, right? Some of these attacks that we've classified to a certain extent, don't make some of these lists maybe because it's shit so broken from the kernel level and above <laughs> right into the applications uh that it doesn't get enough focus i think that's a thing too because we can talk about uh certainly higher level attacks we've got a lot of uh interesting ones um let's talk about the miracle exploit so oracle patched the miracle exploit impacting middleware fusion and cloud services um in these stories okay. i didn't take the the liberty this week to link to the original research but like if you click on the articles that i posted inside of those articles there's a link to the original research and i just as a side note i in you know encourage our listeners to not just read the article which we try and choose news outlets 
to Joseph's point, right, that are trustworthy, that have done a good job of describing the problem. The way that we validate that is I'll read, this one happens to come from the Daily Swig, which is Port Swigger's uh, kind of new news outlet, which is doing fantastic work, although rivaled in some controversy. Maybe we can talk about it at, <laughs> at the end. But uh, th this article on Oracle's uh, The Miracle Exploit actually came from the Daily Swig. And in there, they link to the original research. So it, we have to do our due diligence and go read the original research and understand it to the best of our abilities. And some of the stuff, I mean, gets really in depth and we can't be experts in everything, right? But knowing what we know, I try and go read the original research, then come back to the article and go, did they get it right? <laughs> like, were there, were there comments on point? Did they describe it correctly? Did they go far enough? Did they go far enough? Did they describe it? Act so sometimes I'll read a couple of different articles describing the research after I've read the research and then choose, like, I think this one did the best job. And I don't have time all the time to go through every single article in that depth. Usually it's ones that are more interesting to me and fall in more of my areas of expertise, right, that I'll do that. Um, this one... This one's basically Java deserialization, Tyler, to your point, is huh. what I gather. It's okay, what I so gathered right? from that. We talk, uh, deserialization and Java and vulnerabilities just go hand in hand. I feel <laughs> they're just ripe for the picking. Like there was also uh, class manipulation, some kind of, uh, that I garnered from the, it was a yeah, medium the, article. The, uh, what did he call it? Class. Uh, it wasn't class manipulation. No. It was a uh, class. Oh, what did he call it? Class override. Class override. There you go. There you yep. Go. Yeah, which I mean, now yeah. you get really deep into Java. And, uh, you start to talk about middleware and a lot of, especially the SaaS applications or cloud where you, you think about things like Salesforce, you think about uh, even lower down the chain like Oracle's middleware that is integrating different service applications and the ability to pass information between different services, even with inside the same cloud provider. You think about Azure and something like a uh, a cloud database uh, or AWS and the EBS back storage and S3 volume and how those API calls and different web services interact between each other, you really start to think about like, all right, so how does that data pass? What is the mechanism in which the security tokens, the OAuth, the session tokens, and then the uh, receiving end of that data, how is that actually processed pro and pushed forward to a service in order to be useful at that service layer? Like Those are things that come into an exploit developer or an attacker's mind as they're starting to attack some of these things. And some of these are managing very, very critical aspects. Uh, an Oracle middleware is very big deal because the JSON that's being passed or the authentication being passed between Oracle devices and, say, a cloud service can be as something as sensitive as session keys uh, or um, direct data from logs or transactional mm -hmm. logs. Those are very big deals when you when yeah. you think about what's managed on back end. Let, there's some really interesting things about So if you read the original uh, research, which I, I just posted in our Discord channel uh, and is linked to in the original article. So... Well, the first thing they started was after a month of trying to explore as much as we can and ended up with multiple pre-authentication remote code executions in many products inside Oracle middleware. Any website that was developed by ADF faces framework are affected. This means Oracle's online systems, including Oracle's cloud infrastructure, were affected. So they disclosed the bugs to Oracle. Oracle took almost six months to patch this vulnerability in each product inside Oracle Fusion malware. It gets better. There's more to this story. They reported pre-auth remote code execution to some big companies via their bug bounty program after the patch was released to help them mitigate these issues. So not only was Oracle's products vulnerable, Oracle's cloud was vulnerable, and Oracle's customers that had implemented their software were also vulnerable and had bug bounty programs that were reported. Which is a big deal because Oracle Oracle is so serious about their cloud and like the hard even the hardware they run on. Like they inspect mm -hmm. every piece of hardware coming in, the firmware running on that, where the chips actually communicating, what's communicating across those like <coughs> they're very, very serious about that. And so the fact that this affected so many customers, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. And then you read on, he gives the technical uh, information about how it all kind of plays out. And I basically, well, it boils down to 
deserialization uh, in Java uh, with, with some, some class stuff going on. Scary stuff. Uh, also interesting, uh, the unraw vulnerability that led hackers to attack Zimbra webmail servers. So Zimbra makes, I actually ran Zimbra, I think, for a little while in a past life, many, many moons ago. Because like, you know, I mean, email's email. And like, do you want, what do you want to use to implement your email? And Zimbra had this like proposed solution that you could like stand up email servers really quickly without a lot of administration. But it was complete crap. It was really, really crappy. And we, we pretty quickly abandoned Zimbra um, as, as a platform. I mean, this, I'm talking, this is like 2007. So I don't know what they look like now. But they had a, I thought it was interesting that like Unrar had a vulnerability. And I'm like, how do you get from Zimbra to Unrar? This is basically like your zip email attachments can have vulnerabilities. So I believe the way this played out is if you structured your uh, raw archived in such a way, and so the article says it contains a sim link that's a mix of both forward slashes and backslashes. The way it was interpreted by uh, on oh. raw had the vulnerability, and Zimbra used that on raw uh, extraction method and therefore was vulnerable and allowed the user to write files in a specific way that ultimately allowed them to gain remote code execution. Crazy. It turns it into a path. And when it's in the path, it just it, it in, gets interpreted as code right. and gets run. That's that's not stupid. That's actually kind of cool. Mm. No, um, no however, really, yeah, really cool. I mean, it is. Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. Also, and, kind and of like then, a supply oh, chain. I mean, also a supply chain thing too, right? As an email provider, I'm including this other third party library and/or software that has the vulnerability. Therefore, I'm vulnerable. The RAR, the UNRAR, yeah, the, un, the, un the UNRAR library. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. because because Zimbra supplies that to to uh to uh, unarchive and install the the updates yeah it is a supply chain attack with with a problem no, it, with the software bill of materials so, i think the way i read it, and i had to read some of the articles it was linked to josh the way i read it was it was they're trying to decompress the attachment from an email and they need the raw library to do that so as an attacker you just got to deliver an email with it i'll use this term that i love specially crafted Every vulnerability advisory is you have to send a specially crafted HTTP request or a specially crafted raw archive, right? It's always specially crafted. Curl with, with a user agent that is yeah. not normal. Correct. <laughs> you kill me. Oh my God. <laughs> Being very facetious tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, dude, you kill me. It's hilarious. Like you, you say something like, like, okay, seriously, business world, listen carefully. Every time Tyler smirks, write it down yeah. and go to your security people. Do we have a problem with this? Because Tyler said something and I'm scared, you know, it's threat intelligence based on what Tyler says in the expression on Tyler's face. It's valid. Hey, there've been stupider threat, threat intelligence. It's a valid feeds. threat feed. I think it's a valid threat feed. I'm just saying. <laughs> there have been much stupider threat feeds than yeah, you know it, Paul. Very seriously. True. It's very true. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, that's hilarious, actually. I don't know how we got there, but it's hilarious. Oh, 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 this is another t-shirt, the Tyler Smirk threat feed. Tyler no, no, Smirk the Tyler threat Smirk threat scale. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. All right, let's, let's see if Tyler Smirks on CrowdStrike's latest research on a ransomware actor caught exploiting Mitel VoIP Zero Day. Again, this is one you got to go read the original research from CrowdStrike. Um, and in there, it, basically they determined that, through their investigation, that the threat actors were um, trying to obfuscate their attack. Right, they were trying to cover cover their tracks. Uh, anti forensic techniques is how they is how they describe it. It's a much better phrase, right? And so basically, in reviewing some of the logs, they attackers left behind a no hub dot out file, right? Which is kind of like a the logs as a result of the command that you use no hub to execute that command. It's a command that runs in the background essentially, right? And they kind of deduced what the attackers' motives were by looking at the logs that resulted from the attackers running commands. 
And one of it was they were trying to access a swap file and got operation not permitted. And the article actually goes into to detail. So the ARM command failing to delete the swap file demonstrated ARM was used as part of the NoHop command. The original ARM command uh, run was designed to delete all files but failed on the swap file due to being active resulting in the error message. So they probably were trying to wipe the file system to hide to cover their tracks in this particular case. But they didn't stop there. Then the threat actor used the DD command to create a new file and the size of that file would overwrite all of the free space on the device, but resulted in error message, no space left on the device, which is kind of, that's how they deduced that attackers basically trying to wipe the file system and then fill the file system with garbage, essentially, until there's no space left on the device. Essentially evidence that they were trying to cover their tracks. I thought it was pretty cool. It's a valid threat and one that was actually pretty decent. There's, this is not the only device being leveraged by these attackers. So, is it? But uh, how but, how does this tie into the the other stories that I didn't read? Like, where how this tied into the ransomware? Like, because they're not encrypting the file system in this case. This is a a VoIP device, a Mitel appliance, um, in a VoIP device. But it sounds like they were just wiping it out. So um, let's be in, clear. What this is, is a Linux box with a phone handset attached. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. That they've gotten remote code execution on, that they are uh, uh, exploiting to find out where they can go, and then they are using to do, well, I mean, they're probably going to hit ransomware when they get, when, when they've explored the entire environment, stolen anything they can steal, then they'll ransomware it on their way out effectively. And then they're just wiping and, their tracks on basically the jump off point they used. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Tyler, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Go ahead. No, no. I mean, you're spot on. Like the, the ransomware ecosystem, like when you think about ransomware, you really have to, you have to go higher and you have to think broader. You've got multiple avenues that ransomware as a service is handing off. You've got the botnets in which you're gaining initial access, which could be obtained by the botnet or through initial access brokers where they're purchasing that access and or infiltrating and setting persistence with a different kit or botnet. And that kit is being used to uh, or being sold in order to add a ransomware kit or um, some some infiltration device where that's, you know, they're looking at the information, they're looking at the company, they're seeing what information is available, how much they're worth, if it's a valid target. From there, that brokerage is handed off to ransomware as a service as either initial access, like, hey, ransom this as a point and click ransom, or hey, there's a higher value target, we're going to leverage this in our own internal group and push this for further uh, info that we can leverage and sell off and or ransom this at a higher price. So there's an ecosystem there of multiple avenues, multiple groups, and different kits and toolkits being leveraged in order to do that. This is one of those where they're leveraging this as a jump point and or their mechanism for relay attacks or denial of service or infiltration or botnets. All of these things are being leveraged for further attacks. This is not something that's going to be ransomed directly. However, we're seeing more and more uh, use cases where firmware boot kits and that persistence mechanism where high disruption can be caused by something like, hey, taking out the phone systems for a call center, that's a ransom mm -hmm. in which they may get more money early on for impact versus the data. Now, the double extortion, that's not going to be the case for some place that holds very valuable information and is uh, has a reputation for holding that information. But really, they're they're basing that decision on the business model and the impact that that's going to have, and the, the number of ransoms they're going to be able to get from it. Um, you guys want to <laughs> pivot into debunking some security myths? Uh oh. Oh god. You play, Go to town, Bravey. You want to play debunk security myths? Let's do it. All right. This sounds like a good a good exit strategy. <clears throat> All right. So I, I won't I won't say what the article said. I want to hear everyone's thoughts on. Uh, debunking the myths. Myth one: I have a firewall, so I'm safe from attacks. Oh my! <laughs> I can't gosh. even say it was in 1991. <laughs> in 1991, perhaps. perhaps. Now, not so much. Perhaps there has been a, a, a pretty. It's interesting to look at the shifts in defenses and attacks as happened over the past 
30 years ish right i think there there was a time when your primary attack surface could be protected largely by fire i said largely not a, like this was the whole thing 20 plus years ago we'd be like it's great to have a firewall reduces your attack surface however if you have allow rules in your firewall that's the shit you need to secure <laughs> It's not going to happen magically. Any is not a firewall per se. <laughs> right. I was going there. I was going. But then, you know, Palo Alto comes out and goes, well, we have a smart firewall that can protect you. And did any, it, any application at layer seven is not a firewall per se. Per se. Yes. <laughs> I, also, like, I, I think from the, you know, where I go, like, I have a firewall, so I'm safe from attacks. I think you're safer, maybe not safe, right? What does a like, firewall protect you from, though? Okay, so but if, if you're a home user, I think it's the difference between your machine just hanging out on the internet versus it not being hanging out on the internet. So I think firewalls do play a role, even today, in Wait, I mean, reducing so your attack that, surface. Right? I mean, you can screw it up, right? You can expose your systems to the internet with a firewall, right? I mean, the firewall is a tool. It's not necessarily like a fail-proof safety mechanism but every single one of us at our homes right we have a firewall so all our crap isn't directly exposed to the internet it plays a role it plays a role right. you can still screw it up because it's a tool you can screw it up i mean you get tools in your garage right you got a hammer you got a sawzall i mean every time you use a sawzall you, you can definitely screw it. it's the wrong tool for every job maybe that's like a firewall <laughs> but it does play a role right it does play a role. Your system at home, Tom, is not directly exposed to the internet. You probably have a firewall at home, right? I would imagine. Somewhere in there, someone Somewhere dropped something in. Someone dropped something in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When I bought the system. Even from the provider, like it happens by default, whether on purpose or not. It happens by default. You get an internet connection. Verizon comes into your home or Cox or wherever your provider is. It, it's one of the two here in Rhode Island, right? And they said, here's this device that'll connect you to the internet. That's a firewall. Part of that functionality of that device is a firewall. Make sure your stuff's not hanging out willy-nilly on the internet. Now you can still screw that up. You can go in there and start mucking with stuff, start exposing stuff to the internet, and that could be a bad day. I mean, you talk about NAT, though. You talk about, like, NAT, dynamic NAT, punching holes through firewall, all of, all of the different things that are happening on your firewall for connections to get out and your IoT device to work, your Fire Stick to work, your Roku to work, all of those things that make it work. Like, is a firewall providing more than routing at this point? No, but well, uh, I, I think there are, it but can. it does, it does block it direct internet traffic, right? But like today, it's a smaller, much smaller, a small percentage of the problem, to Tyler's point. Your stuff or the stuff behind your firewall is reaching out to the internet and bringing crap back in through your email right. and your web browser yeah. and your IoT, that, your, that is, IoT is your IoT your IoT right. devices. Like everything is reaching out, you can still communicating with the internet, and your firewall largely is not helping that, right? Because especially in most consumer devices, hopefully corporations have you know much better rules against. But everyone works from home, right? You can connect to anything on the internet on any port in most firewall configurations and that's the thing we harped on even josh back in the 90s right we we're like firewalls don't unless you configure some stuff but that's just, you're just playing whack-a-mole right unless stuff you do egress monitoring and unless you do all sorts of right different things it's but really you tough let to, something to control out, you gotta let something out to the internet at some point which is where yep. all, you know <clears throat> most of your uh threats are going to come through now i mean which dns, is, which is, DNS is, is an example moved. we talk about DNS yeah. tunneling, right? Like you got to talk to the internet to resolve names, and therefore that's the protocol that people, you know, attackers are going to use to, you know, tunnel out. I mean, step from the consumer side back to the enterprise side. Hopefully, we're doing monitoring on the enterprise side and detecting those style attacks, right? But now you're talking about like the security poverty line in, in that in that respect. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that's the difference that that's really what we're we've moved to and what attackers have moved to and why social engineering and clicking links and right. you know, watering holes and JavaScript, you know, ad campaigns, all of those things are because the connections are now having to reach back out. Anything is basically allowed outbound on a good portion of the internet. Mm -hmm. The inbound yep. pieces where we don't have direct exposed ports or services hanging out listening 
for the most part, um, out on firewalls is what your firewall is really protecting. You need a firewall. It's a good layer of defense. It does not protect you from hacking. It protects you from those direct inbound attacks on things that you've not exposed. Unless you've that's, enabled universal plug and play, in which case your devices <laughs> are now managing your firewall and exposing stuff to the internet. Uh, like, whose, idea, whose idea was that anyway? That's just like a It horrible... was a hacker, 100%. Like, if I wanted to create a protocol in which I wanted to be able to get in and out of a network very easily, like, UPnP would be 100% what I would make. I, it's perfect. Like, it's, so, like, Tom, what this means is, like, you've got a firewall at home, right? So people can't directly connect to right. your devices, but you put a device on your network like a camera system <laughs> or DVR. It talks to your firewall and goes, open up these ports to the internet. So that you can be out to dinner and you can go check your camera. That's essential. I would I would just inject myself. I would have people in like fourteen different companies for very popular consumer devices and go, yeah, okay, tell it to open up these ports as well. Yeah, it's it's and, and this one extra port so we can port knock on that hardware firmware uh, input put on the chips. So all they're right, sitting myth, in myth in number two. So we've debunked <laughs> the firewall. Myth number two. I use HTTPS so my site is secure. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 look. Let's be clear. It I is good HTTPS to use. Too. Right. It is good more, to use HTTPS. It's more attack surface. <laughs> you can make that argument. If you have more attack surface. I love right? it. Yeah. Let's just say. Uh, certificate, it, but I, like TLS is in certificate, like it's painful. Sometimes I mean they're talking about in the context of a website, right? And like I get their their example here, right? That like it doesn't make your website more secure. It 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 helps preserve the transaction between users and the server so that you can conduct e commerce transactions online. I think it's the most shining example of the it RSA the RSA right the security. RSA algorithm. Large, like yeah. I was telling this to my kids. We're listening to Crypto by Steve Levy in the car. My kids are listening to how Diffie Hellman and the RSA protocols were created and the whole story behind it. It's an amazing book. Everyone should read it. It's, it's a great, awesome book, right? And, uh, and like I, I paused it at certain points and I'm like, I'm like, boys, do you understand like what they're saying here? And they're like, dad, I have no idea. <laughs> and I'm like, basically, what they're talking about is the creation of, of of this security protocols, right? That allow you to go buy stuff online, right? When you you guys come to me and you want to buy stuff online, you're like, I found this thing on Amazon, Dad. I want to use my my money. Can you go, you know, buy it with your credit card online? I'm like, none of that would be possible had these like crazy guys of Diffie and Hellman and the RSA folks had um, created these programs. I'm like, and guess what, guys? It's all based on math. And they're like, oh, no, not math, Dad. Like, math is terrible. We don't like you know, math. Is... I'm like, it's all based on math, guys. Like, it's it's really astonishing. They're talking about the people that made it possible for you to buy your useless crap online, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they the were Mr. like mind blown. Post his damn video. They were like mind blown. And I'm like, it's all about math. And like, oh, shit. Everything's about I math. It is. I mean, especially when we talk about cryptography and, the, and these protocols. I mean, it's it's all about math. So, so, so uh, Adrian is is asking if uh, personal VPNs are on the list. Please tell me they are. All right, myth oh, number. God. I don't think they are. But it says myth number three. Ah. Myth number three. Security isn't my concern when I'm hosting my website on someone else's hosting space. Oh my gosh! I we shared that. responsibility shared, model. Like, shared. Matt Alderman actually has the. Um, one of the greatest slides on this on this i think the greatest slide in this topic right and it, it takes you all through like you're gonna host everything yourself all the way through i'm going to like host this lambda function and it's just going to run my code and everything else is hosted on the cloud provider and everything else in between right <laughs> and then it's a matrix of where the security responsibilities fall in each one of these models if you run everything yourself you're responsible for pretty much all the security. I mean, you might be able to work with your ISP and get some security there, right? It, but because your internet connection is provided by the ISP, and that's the only the aspect there, right? All the way through, like, where's the responsibility of security if I'm just hosting my application somewhere in the cloud and everywhere in between containers, 
um, hosted instances, EC2, the whole the whole thing. So hosting your website, right, just means that there's lines of where Josh, you said the uh, shared responsibility model, right? Yep. That's just determining where the line is. I'm responsible for my website. And the provider's responsible for the security of everything beyond that. It's just where we draw the lines. And so, like, if you host WordPress with a provider, you're responsible for a, a lot of the security in, in your own WordPress instance, right? The provider's responsible for the underlying architecture and security of that and the infrastructure. But you're still responsible. If you install a vulnerable plugin on your WordPress... And you hosted somewhere it's your else. Fault. It's your fault. You're still screwed. <laughs> this is why I love the companies that go, we're installed in SOC 2 compliant hosting, so we're SOC 2 certified. Mm, mm, and I go, no. Mm, no. No, that's not how that works. Nope. <sighs> Myth number four. If a computer is not connected to a network or the internet, it can be not be attacked by viruses. Stop. Stop. I mean... I mean, that's like like my one thing, but like, it just takes one word, one word to debunk that. Have you read Countdown to Zero Day, Tom, by Kim no. Zetter? Great book. You totally read it. Countdown to Zero Day. Yep. You're going to get homework. That's that, Okay. Yep. You got the, some... I mean, the, the new books ransomware... Books are awesome. There's some great books that like... That's a great book. It's a great book. It's a great book. Okay. Mm. Yeah, Once there, you read that book and then you hear this book. myth, you'll be like, oh, Stuxnet. <laughs> okay. There's a ton of yeah. new ransomware that's leveraging this right now. Like they're using LNKs and the shortcuts that are hidden yep. on jump drives in order to spread uh, malicious ISOs that don't have the mark of the web in order to DLL inject a DLL onto a local device spreading over USB. Like this is a thing. It's yeah, happening that, now. That, that ISO method, that ISO method is not new. I mean, it's basically a CD-ROM no. emulation. That's really fascinating. It's only new because they just caught on that you can do that and not get yeah. the marker of the web, which has a bunch of security protocols. Like we've been using this since like 2015. Like okay. this is not okay. new. It's not a new There's thing. There's other protocols and other extensions that have the same thing if you look into it. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's interesting. So I mean, and obviously, like the old school thing. I I think we talked about the USB device in the parking lot in early episodes in 2000. 2006 on the show right I mean this is like it doesn't matter if your computer's connected to the internet or not I, I really think some of the, the attacks we we saw on that like really date back to when we first created the podcast maybe even sooner maybe even earlier of pen testers would just you know alright you're doing a pen test I take a bunch of USB thumb drives I put my malware on them and I leave them in the, the parking lot employees pick them up and they plug them into a computer I mean, you take that step further, you got all the supply chains, you look at something like bad USB or or any of the, the supply chains where you can stick a chip on a USB cable that looks exactly the same, same yep. identity, same size, and it can execute code. It can be remotely, you know, using Bluetooth low energy or Wi-Fi access point. You can turn it on, uh, interact with the host, do all kinds of crazy stuff like it's a big deal from the standpoint of what gets plugged into your computer. And this is still not something that people think about. Like we've been touting this since like early mm. 2014, like whatever you plug into your computer has a risk and it's going to become more of a risk as we move forward with. And Tyler, smaller to, to your point in, in supply chain, in the, you get into the BMC, right? Baseband management controller. It's becoming one of my favorite like supply chain attacks. Like it's literally a computer inside your computer that can control everything with your computer and let you rebuild it and do what I mean it's literally intended for an administrator to do whatever they want to the computer if the computer craps the bed right and to get in that supply chain it's just amazing because like everything else like the actual hardware in your computer all the way through the operating system like doesn't matter like I control the computer inside your computer that to me is like the alt, one of the ultimate supply chain attacks. So I don't necessarily have to yeah. like wait till it's been delivered. If I control in, in, in different you know ways, this happens, right? I control the BMC in your computer. Like it, it doesn't matter. I can control everything. I can rebuild your whole operating system remotely if I want to. That's what it was intended to do. And if I control that, all bets are off. That's that, yeah, that, that's, that's that's just that's just the BMC. That's like the really really awesome shit. Like that doesn't even talk to the IPMI or any of the out of band stuff that is there to manage servers and cloud right. providers. 
and or you talk about things like HDMI cables. Like the, you look at the Vault 7 leaks, like CIA and NSA have had toolkits that will embed the ability to send picture across the, the network over an HDMI cable that's implanted. Like mm. you think about supply chain and the things you plug in and trust – like it gets pretty it's a pretty big tinfoil hat like the usb cable running into this microphone what's being said across alexa the uh ethernet cables plugged in to manage my isp and the bandwidth that's going across those devices doxis three modems that your isp manages and updates on their own and you don't have access to like you talk about supply chain and the ability of people to get in the middle of things it's a deep dark hole that can keep going Mm -hmm. myth number five small or medium-sized businesses do not make a worthwhile target i'll go to i'll go to josh on this one (laughs) small to medium businesses make an extremely worthwhile target because they have tiny security and they are supply chain suppliers and customers of companies that have lots of money oh wait was it target i don't know that got hacked by their hvac company right How many companies does a law firm, I mean, Tom, let me ask you a question. Uh, How many companies does a law firm, a corporate law firm, you know, uh, not, not one that's inside of a company, but one that deals with companies like mergers and acquisitions. How many companies do they deal with in a year? Oh, hundreds, thousands. I would imagine a large law firm, like a Ropes and Gray. I mean, they were thousands. I mean, it's just. And they have all the juiciest stuff. And, and, and And a good friend of mine's law Please leave a message after the tone. This is only a <laughs> test. <laughs> if this is a true emergency. <laughs> um, a, a good friend of mine's law firm uh, four years ago, uh, every file was compromised. I mean, and, and now there's this ongoing uh, security and seminars and how to secure the law firm uh, file. I mean, that they do everything electronically. You know, paper files are, the, are gone. Everything's electronic. So... Uh, law firms are, are, are small businesses have more to lose in oftentimes financially. So, um, yeah, it, they're, they're a huge risk, small, small to medium sized uh, companies. Well, and so these, also, these law firms, go ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, well, I mean, these, these law ahead. firms are, I've, damn it, man, you want to dance or what? So, Let's dance. <laughs> so law firms are the, oh God, the smirk. <laughs> Law firms have all the juiciest details in their files. You want to know the dirt on a company? Go to their mergers and acquisitions firm and look at their f- the file on that company. They have all the dirt. Oh, yeah. And honestly, it's it's also they have everybody to talk to. They know where all the skeletons are buried. They know everything. And their their security is typically piss poor. Okay, let's be honest. And they have connections into so many different trust accounts, so many different banking and accounting systems, so many different everything. It's not even funny. No, I, w- I was going. In, I mean, if, Tom, I was, uh, if I was an attacker, I would be going after the applications that law firms use where they keep their minutes, where they keep those files, where they scan the documents in something like Time uh, Matters. Oh, okay, not Petya. <laughs> 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 I see where you're going. I, I want to take it to uh, slightly, you know, off this topic, but um and, and largely this stems from my listening of jack Resider's uh, amazing podcast darknet diaries and if you listen to i mean uh, i've listened to pretty much almost every episode of jack's podcast right and he's got a very different take on him if you have to, if you haven't listened to this podcast tom you definitely want to check it out it's called darknet diaries right and he kind of chronicles these um cyber criminal like he'll interview the actual cyber criminals or her interview folks like us in law enforcement that have dealt with some of these cases, right? A good number of these cases deal with these crimes that kind of fly under the radar, right? I mean, a lot of it's like fraud, Mm. um, but also abuse. So kind of like we talk about Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, right? These are definitely like classes of fraud and abuse, but like fly under the radar to really get law enforcement attention to warrant the effort to prosecute these criminals. And I and I think without question, these are criminal acts. So I'll give you some examples. Um, and this, this shit really grinds my gears because in a, a couple of cases, they've tied it back to cybersecurity professionals. They're doing this as a side hustle. 
and basically using fraud and abuse and extortion to commit these crimes that they know is kind of flying under that that radar. Like people can't go to get law enforcement attention to 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 prosecute these crimes and prosecute the criminals. So, like in in one case uh, of this, uh, are social media accounts. So let's say I have an Instagram account that's a short short three letter acronym or an English word that has a high value on these forums where if someone is able to obtain that account, they can go sell it for five, 10, 20, 50, hundred thousand dollars, right? Like, like the prices vary depending on what it is. So what they'll do is they'll conduct uh, open source intelligence gathering on the holder of, I don't know, I got Instagram and it's turtles right random like random they don't like to say what the actual names are like let's just say it's turtles right and i know okay now this person xyz owns turtles well what can i find about person xyz now i got their name their address their phone number their family members this is not i mean there's varying levels of skill and this level of intelligence gathering so i got my target now i send that person pizza cod call you know i go online or call you know local pizza places and you know maybe it's People that are open late and midnight, you're getting pizza delivered. Next night, you're getting more pizza delivered. And then I define, I, I establish some communication with my target, and I say, you're going to keep getting these pizzas until you transfer that account to me, right? And they're like, what the hell? They go, to but I love pizza. Yeah, but <laughs> it, whether you love pizza or not, <laughs> right, right, right. you get a pizza at midnight three nights in a row when you're right. trying to sleep. Like that really, that can really suck, right? Then they're going to in another attack. They go to USPS and they order a thousand boxes because they're like free. Like there's some loophole where I got all these boxes shipped to this person's house. Like what do you do with a thousand, you know, uh, you know, shipping, boxes. Ma- shipping, shipping boxes, right? Like that's a major inconvenience. Now I got pizza being delivered at midnight. My garage is full of, you know, boxes and, and I'm, I'm trying to extort basically this, what what is a high value account that this person can sell and it extends sometimes to swatting but swatting tends to be something that people will prosecute for like that tends to get people's attention and there's actually been laws i believe you would know better than i that have passed about swatting right mm-hmm. so i'm calling in a fake crime sometimes they're doing this over international borders but all of this activity is kind of flying under the like there's not much prosecution going on here in the, in these particular crimes and that really grinds my gears, Tom. Like, I, I it yeah. really grinds my gears. It does. It makes me angry. And how many dollars are they getting from these people for this type I mean, of extortion? It, it, it could be Tyler Josh way in here, right? Like, it depends on what you're extorting. Like, a three-letter Twitter yeah. name. I'm not sure what the current street value is. You could be getting tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. Just hundreds. Oh, could, be hundred, could be hundreds of thousands. Could be. Could be, yeah. and so I mean, what? So what you know what happens? It, like, you know, you know what? It, what pisses me off the most is like sometimes these people are like, yeah. So I just gave up my account. Like I just gave it to them because like that was the end. It was an end to the situation. Like these people are so stressed out. They've been swatted. Pizzas are being delivered to their house in all hours of the night. Like you know, packages are being delivered. Tyler, Josh, can you think of any other activities that these folks are conducting? Maybe sim swap, uh, they're, sim swapping. They're, Sim swapping, their their cameras are getting hacked mm-hmm. into, and the people are talking through them. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yep. They're extorting family, social media accounts. Yes, family families. Hosting, they're going. To, the my mom to calls me the next day and goes, "What? Pizza? Someone ordered a pizza and delivered it like midnight at my house. They're going after their family now, and they live in a different. Their family lives in a different state. And they're like, what the hell's going well, on? Well, continually sending text messages across to mm-hmm. you know kids phones with right. pornographic material posting questionable stuff as friends on your social media that's public or your family social media like there's a lot of ways to apply pressure to people that they are very quick to bend yep and how are they, ca- are they catching in these people i think a very no. they're gonna be a small amount like, actually- like a small percentage right yeah it's got to be. If if they're catching, like, they don't have the techn- technological prowess in order to trace and or go after, much less prosecute uh, other than, you know, filing a police case, which right. allows you some protection for things like, you know, fraud or abuse of, of uh, financial or monetary fraud over a certain amount. But past that, 
there's zero protection uh, unless you start to involve kids or, or things that or swatting. Uh, I feel, I feel like even, even that, I feel like there's that, laws, but I feel like there's laws in the books for swatting, and it seems like swatting would be with points where the, but you're talking the, about local local or county government and their mm. ability to go after and trace that like yeah it, it does use resources and they are very serious about it mm-hmm. but their ability to leverage and go uh, cross jurisdiction and prosecute that and get an, an interoperability between agencies in order to go after someone doing that like, and it's got to be they could be internet like god forbid they're outside the u.s like Oh, yeah. Now you got to go get a, a federal law enforcement agency to You'll get attention. Get them if they're out to get the attention country. in this case, and I heard something. Someone made mention in something I was listening. Like, unless you're a politician or have influence, no one's going to pick up your case, man. Like, no one's going to pick this up if you're just yep. you know average U.S. citizen and you got a three letter Twitter account, dude. No one cares. That's why it's, why it's good to know a hacker or two. Like, uh, keep them on your books and on the good side. Tyler, but, Tyler's been amazing no. at helping people in these situations. Uh, I've been kind of light touch helping people in these. Si- Tyler's Tyler. That would be a Tyler great to like to a fault will help people. That's what I love about Tyler. You're amazing, dude. And and Tyler has helped people in a lot of these, you know, situations. But it's like falling under that law enforcement yeah. threshold. It's almost like a nuisance crime that they're trying. Yes. To, uh, yes. They're just creating a nuisance of themselves just mm-hmm. to yeah. I'll it's like, whatever. It's like well, petty, petty, uh, petty, petty extortion. Th- yeah. It is extortion. It I mean, it's extortion, extortion right? Extortion. Yeah. I mean, you would it's label, extortion. You would label that extortion. Yeah. 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 So how do I mean? Now we've defined the problem. Like, I mean, short of you like phone a friend, right? And you just happen to know a Paul, a Josh, or a Tyler, right? And well, go well, and happens. go like help me. And we're like, all right, like we a lot of the times can probably unravel this and and, and find them. But then like, what do you do? Like. Paul or Tyler or Josh is not going to commit a crime to, to against this attacker. Like that doesn't make it. Tyler's smiling. Look at Tyler's face. Look at Tyler's face. Look at he's, he's got he's got the Tyler face on. <laughs> if you commit a crime against these people, you don't want to get caught. <laughs> Let's yeah, exactly. We're not yeah. going to get caught committing a crime. Right. There's a difference, right. Paul. Okay. Getting caught. But does that does this crime. make us like a, a Robin Hood or like a Batman or like a superhero that's like committing a crime but we're doing it in the in, in for, for the greater uh, good cross, i would imagine like 80 percent of them don't even get reported country, like, i would yeah, imagine it might, it most might, of them don't get even reported but a lot of them do get so a lot of folks from what i've heard from multiple of these stories and and again props to jack for like bringing this to light so we can have this discussion right in in a very in-depth manner jack has made a lot of these details of these cases um available and oftentimes they'll go start with local law enforcement right They'll start with calling their local police department, and that usually goes nowhere. Yeah. And then they go to the state level, and they, they might get some attention, but usually not. Then you can file to have your case heard with like a, a federal law enforcement agency like the FBI. Like, good, good luck getting that. Unless yeah, there's... Like, what's the FBI threshold for getting their attention not, and monetary gonna, value? Yeah. Monetary value, I feel like it's got to be... Over a million dollar. I mean, it used to be. I feel like it used to be a lot lower, but if it's not it a big corporation or it's not, what is it now, Tyler? You think to get FBI attention? Five million. Mm. Five million. Five million. Well, oftentimes, all the FBI does is refer it back million. to the the city of town. Mm. If you go through the IC three right. report, they're, they're going to refer it back. The IC three is pretty much worthless. It's worthless. They're going to send it back to the city of town mm-hmm. and refer it back to them. And unless they have a cybercrime unit. Even if they would had one, I mean, with all the well, child porn right. and all that crap, and all that going crap, on, it, it's it's never going to get addressed. Well, you think about you think about the drug the drug industry, right? And you think about even things like um, border patrol, where DHS is managing border patrol. They're not after the the smugglers, the one time package, even the large shippers of people putting in stuff. They're after the chain. They'll let that package go. All the way through customs and border patrol, they'll make it to the distributor. They'll follow the distributor up to where it's getting cut and processed and, and hitting the street vendor. They're really trying to figure out the distribution pattern and get the intel. Same thing for large CTI places. They're not after the the one officer, two officer, even 
you know, the $5 million scammers, they're trying to figure out who's making the ransomware, the crypto groups. In fact, if you're looking at nation state level and they're trying to identify ransomware groups, they're not even so much concerned at the ransomware level because those are disbanded. They're different groups. They're, they're managed at multiple hierarchies. They're looking at where they can cause the most disruption, which is at the people that are doing the coding, the cryptors that are handling the obfuscation and the crypting of all these toolkits across multiple ransomware levels. That's where you really start to distribute and cause disruption. Maybe at a large scale botnet shutdown if it gets too big, but even that is kind yeah, of like a Tyler, low level street. Difference. You got me thinking, what about, uh, and I'm trying to find solutions to this problem, right? Like, what yeah. about, we had Ray Davidson on that was talking about creating incident response for largely businesses that is funded by the state where businesses can get support for cybersecurity in an incident response capacity. I'd almost like to see similar legislation for each state to have some kind of organization, because it's not CISA, right? Because it's not critical, would, it's not yeah. critical infrastructure, right? We're yeah. talking about like personal fraud and abuse to have something in each state where this can be reported and acted upon to help curb some of this. Cause you're like, like most, most laws and such forth, like are not solving a hundred percent of crimes. Right. right. But you're, you're reducing that, that number by a, a significant amount so that you're curbing most of the crime. But then I would you get, love to see that a, as a you, community effort though. Right. Like, yes, as they a have, like, a, like some funding with some volunteers, and it would have to yeah. be at a state level where if I'm in California, right? Because some of the stories they talk about, like the guy was like, oh, I'm a technology person in Silicon Valley and I follow tech closely. And when Instagram came out, like I registered this account and like didn't think anything of it and like built up a following and like it was cool. And now all of a sudden, like my life is hell, my stress levels through the roof and this is seriously impacting my life and no one can help this poor person, right? So how do we build an infrastructure where that person can go to the California state like fraud and abuse uh, department it's gotta, it's gotta be and file, government. file, their, cl file their claim and have someone help them with this and, and help law, maybe have law enforcement. Involved. I don't know. It's a, it's a big effort for something that's not critical infrastructure, right? It's not a high value crime. And that's why they're getting away with it. And they're getting away because they can. And, yeah. it, and it's not getting anybody's attention. Mm -hmm. and, and the only way to get people's attention is the unfortunately to lobby a po your politicians at the community level and right and and pass some legislation i mean if, well so i think I, that, that's where we have legislation to, we could have help, to, but it have to come with government. funding it would have to come with funding it would, the, it, but like you have to have the justification for these resources right and just because it or grinds incentive, paul's gears is not enough no, there's no. not enough justification for no. all of these resources to go after these bad actors that are extorting uh digital assets for and, and, and the other question is it so, enough in numbers to get people's attention i mean mm. i mean it, it's happening we know it's happening but say out of a hundred thousand people uh, and it's happening to one out of a hundred thousand right. is that something to get anybody's yeah you, you you need you need to leverage it as as in two fashions one you need to gamify it so that you have the community support around it Mm. where you can get badges maybe maybe it's on the blockchain maybe you get an nft if you help someone and you get a badge for doing it and or you have the ability to leverage this from a job uh a job perspective where if you just like a certification you add hey i've just been sitting i, I don't have a job right now i'm trying to get into info i'm helping all these people i've got all these nft minted badges of areas in which i've supported and done cti and investigative right, work right. and helped recover accounts and now it shows that my real world street value is there and credibility is there uh, and I've donated time to do it and or you're experiencing you donate back to the community because you have a little time and you've put that effort in. Both of those have intrinsic value with inside the community for uh, things outside of monetary compensation. Yeah, I mean, but also, you know, what got me thinking what you just said, Tyler, is how much of the onus can we put on the providers of these accounts? I don't want to pick on Instagram and I wanted to ask this, uh, you know, Tyler, I know Josh had to drop, right? And, uh, but I want to ask this of our host, Instagram seems to be on the uptick of account takeover. Uh, and I know there's people that, that work tirelessly 
to secure Instagram's infrastructure. And I don't want this to look badly on them because they have their work cut out. Like, I just think they're, they pulled like the unlucky card <laughs> that they're working, happened to be working for the company that is seeing a huge uptick in fraud just based on my friends and family that have come to me and been like, happened to my son. Like, I lost my Instagram account. What What is yep. up with it? Tyler, do you have any insight? Like, have you seen an uptick in this? I've certainly seen an uptick in this. 100%. Like, even my daughter, my daughter's account got taken over. And I was yeah, like, so oh, my son's account. Oh, okay, so here we go. So here we, are. <laughs> so here we are. Like, security people and our kids' accounts are getting taken over on our Instagram. And again, I feel bad for the folks that are trying to do the right thing and do cybersecurity for Instagram. You folks have I feel your, bad for the you, people that are trying to do this to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, well, that too. I mean, you know, we don't want to promote vigilanteism, right? We want to solve this at a, at a systemic level, right? Not just, bear, not just like you got to know a Paul or a Tyler or a John, well, well, like whatever. Well, the first thing yeah. I think you have to do is quantify the problem. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we've, we've got anecdotal issues. We get that podcast, mm -hmm. but I mean, quantify the numbers. If the numbers are large enough, it should get at worst get the the the, the press's attention, the, the news right. outlets' attention, right. to say this is happening. This is this is a, a big issue. But if it's a small issue, I'm not sure you're going to get, when I say a small issue, but, small issue statistically in numbers. But let's say, Tom, statistically, we can show that there's a, a high uptick in these account extortion and account takeover attacks. Could legislation that more easily allows for prosecution of these crimes help? Or does that get balanced with law enforcement's ability to actually prosecute the crimes? Right. Well, we were talking about this on the break. Well, this is exactly well, what we're talking well, about on the break, there's right? two issues here. Mm. A, you could pass all the legislation in the world and give law enforcement as much power and authority as they can. But, but they, they need resources. The tools and the resources yes. to do it, it's, it's not going to be on anybody's radar. You, you mentioned texting and driving. How do you enforce that, right? I see people driving all... And going, texting all... all the, it, the phone in their faces. I mean, it, it's bad. I see it every well, day. I mean, mm. <sighs> The reason, the reason you're seeing things like Instagram is, right, like so Facebook, for example, there's not a ton of monetary value you get from taking over a Facebook account. Like you get some grandma's pictures, some cat stuff, like maybe there's a business or marketplace associated with it, great. Instagram, there's a monetary value happening from people that are influencers that are yes. doing clothing design. It's a business market. Things like TikTok, you've got very large accounts. YouTube, same thing. Mm -hmm. Like all of those things have very stringent monetary oh, I had a story. I had a story. They're going after YouTubers. I thought I oh, had a man. story. I didn't describe it, oh. but I saw something this this week. You look Tyler. at the money. Yeah, their attackers are targeting account takeover attacks for YouTubers because they're monetizing so much. Instagram, you're right, Tyler. Influencers are so these are these have monetary value, and cyber criminals are going after them, and it's a problem because largely they're flying under the radar. And it's usually, it's not necessarily even the monetary value of owning that account. Like, yeah, you could probably change some account numbers, get some, you know, monthly funding flowing through that, that may last mm -hmm. a little while. But you think about the brand and the recognition and the amount of content that people are posting and their subscribership. Each video has so many views that need to be hit in order to maintain that level and the payout for each of those. I mean, you're looking for 10 million, you know, 15 million views per video. That content has to be put out weekly, daily, even sometimes multi-daily in order to keep that subscribership up and keep the numbers at the, the rate at which they need. Any downtime in there and brand yeah. Um, discrepancy, that's where they start to make their money. They're holding that as ransom and they're using the extortion around that brand reputation and amount of time that they're not able to put content out that matters. That's where the real money starts to play but into one thing, that. That's and better we talked, than some businesses. But Tyler, we talked about this in the cryptocurrency sense too. Some of the responsibility falls on the user and some of it falls on us as security professionals to evangelize this, the OPSEC of your account. Like that's, you should have a really good password you should have multi-factor authentication. Like if well, you, multi, if you don't have those, if you don't have those two things, the only and, way it's going, to, the only way Instagram or these these hosting sites are going to get involved because they don't have to because they're a hosting site and the law says right. they don't just, care. They an don't account care. is an account, account right? right? So they're not responsible for personal postings and they're not mm -hmm. responsible for a lot of things. But if it gets raised to the level where it becomes a in the radar of this is what's going on with Instagram accounts. If Instagram starts losing accounts because of this, right? Again, the money issue will well, that's, always. Well, that's the issue with them, like monopoly of it. Like, what, they, what's they, the they, competition to 
Instagram. That's the problem. That's the problem. Once the competition is Twitter, Facebook. If they lose 3% of their accounts, they're not going to lose any sleep over that. Right. They're not going to act unless it impacts their bottom line and their responsibilities to shareholders. But again, it has to be a big enough issue numbers Mm. to even for a politician to take it up. But I I thought that was really impactful with Elon Musk purchasing Twitter. And however you feel about that, right? One of the aspects of that deal was show me what your actual accounts are, not your bots, right? Slightly different issue than what we're talking about. Right. The, you know, taking over accounts is different than fake accounts, but putting the responsibility on Twitter to have accurate reporting is is really interesting because it, it's it ties monetized. into it's, 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 everything's monetized yeah. in, the, in in Twitter. So if if you can't monetize it and if they're fake accounts, then he's not going to get any money out of it. So I mean, but that that's the financial issue as far as again I, I keep i don't want it to be redundant but unless you can quantify and say this is what's happening this is the number of people it's happening to um and how do you do that mm. you get you get a but it's not just about stronger laws no, i mean i think I, it's something we touched on right like stronger laws that allow law enforcement to prosecute this type of extortion and how do you find is only them? part of the problem because then you got to find them and you got to have the right funding to find them and then you got to prosecute them the whole the whole thing it's a rabbit hole problem. It's, it's hard enough to find a, a, a 10 million dollar mm-hmm. ransomware uh, right. uh cryptocurrency falls into the same that's thing a, that's right like a tally, you see this all I mean, we've covered like someone steals 10 million dollars in cryptocurrency where how, who, who do you go to to how do you figure that good out luck. how do you get that back like good luck yeah, well, that goes luck. back to the preventative. Like we've got to get past. Like this is even this goes into corporate security, AD security, like all the security mechanisms. We've got to get past this password level security where we're relying on mm. something that is proven to be ineffective, and we've got to make the leap and in innovation to get around and do mitigating and compensating controls that actually matter and fix or protect this. Like no, I I agree. At what point are we doing this? Is but this, also is I, this, it's an creative uh, awareness. But also too. I am sorry to interrupt, but also I was listening to a great podcast with a private investigator. Oh, in fact he was he's presented at Hope. Steve Ram Ram Rambam, right? Was that his name? No Ram, Steve something I'm getting the name wrong. But do he he's presented at Hope and stuff like that. I'm getting his name wrong. His voice sounded familiar. I think he he did the 2600 like radio show and podcast back in the day because i'm like this dude's voice sounds so familiar but he's a private investigator and he articulated the role that private investigators play in supplementing law enforcement which i thought was which i thought was kind of fascinating and he has responded to cases of fraud they kind of like fall outside of law enforcement. And that's exactly what we're talking about. So maybe part of the solution here is to create an industry of so-called private investigators that you run up in roadblocks against the companies that are providing these accounts. You run up to law, uh, law enforcement roadblocks. They don't want to take the case. And there's a service you can go to that's pri- that's a private investigator that or, or a, you know, Tyler Paul, like the, a service that you can go right. to and say, I'm a victim of this. You can help me with this. And they, they have to provide some kind of license to maybe to be able to do this work just like private investigators do. Hopefully not as stringent because I think some of the laws in the states and private investigators are really, really stringent. Well, I wrote, I wrote uh, Doug and I wrote a number of papers on licensing of cyber. Uh, it, it is very ridiculous. specific, right? As you well know, Tom, you're very intimately close to this to this particular and, issue, right? Like it's very specific in every single state. Uh, in highly regulated in most states, right, like right. in Rhode Island, you have to almost serve law as a law enforcement most officer. States, most, most states you most have states to serve as a law enforcement military, officer, military, and then you have to have so many hours and so many years as a and an then, apprentice, and then you can, separate licenses for like if I want to carry a firearm as a private investigator, if I want this level of access or that level of access, it's like a separate, highly regulated, highly regulated, and, and for a digital examiner or a, a computer forensic person. Mm. Uh, to go down that road, it, it, it can take a long, and they, they may take be years. Fore, yeah, and years. they can be foreclosed from doing it because they don't have the right credentials to right, or they do don't pass a background check or what? Right. It's a stringent background check. Yeah, yeah. but I, I see in the future potentially a similar industry created for this kind of digital um, extortion and fraud. Well, oftentimes what you find is not the government's not the answer, mm. and, and oftentimes mm. what you find out is there's an opportunity from an 
economic standpoint for people that do this type of work. I, right. I don't know where that lies. I, I really don't. I mean, uh, you guys are in the, the world of, of computer security and cybersecurity and, and I don't Monetarily, know. I think it comes down to like maintaining a good presence and doing good things in this industry. Like the money sorts itself out later, yeah. but honestly, getting and doing good things just because they're good to do, I think that is one of the differentiators in this industry that hopefully continues to maintain and happen as we move forward. Because we can't do everything, but we can also do a lot, and a lot often makes a big difference in little ways that articulate themselves later on down the road and. I think if we can continue to do that and more of us get involved, then that makes a big difference long term. And, and it has yeah, to, so it it has I'm sorry, it was Stephen, uh, Steve Rambam who was presented. I think he was arrested at Hope. He was involved in some controversy. Uh, it, but uh, uh, episode 685 of the Jordan Harbinger Show, which is one of my favorite podcasts as well, it's a great podcast. And he was other, talking about the private. So he was the one that would like it, it, it maybe draw those kind of correlations in my brain that this could be. A, a private investigator like uh, oh, yeah. service that's provided to people that again I'm not getting anywhere with law enforcement I, I I'm the victim of this crime there's laws are kind of fuzzy on this and so I have to go to private and industry. you have to create awareness with the public I yep. mean, that's, that's the first step you have to create the awareness with the public to let them know this is going on so right. that they have an outlet to go to if they were in fact... And perhaps a, a certification program to have a license to do this kind of work would help the consumer, right? Oh, yeah. Is, is that why these laws... Basically, it helps the consumer to go, if I go to a private investigator, well, allegedly, they have some integrity? Is that allegedly? Allegedly. I, mean, I, think, allegedly. I, think, I think it's more to protect the private investigator industry and to, to keep... It's a guarding. It's a walling it really, off. It really, of that. It really yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, some, of these, some of these states have such ridiculous requirements uh, for a digital exam and to become a private investigator, uh, yeah, it's almost not even worth it for a lot of a lot of companies. But I mean, public awareness is the key. And mm. like you're telling me, I'm hearing this for the first time. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know this this crime existed, and apparently it, it is. And to what extent, I don't know. But there has to be a public awareness mm -hmm. because people don't know where to go if that does happen to them. Right. So. Well, the where to go and the people that actually can do something after the where to go is the big problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. people know it exists. People, it happens to people, but they either have a friend that knows a friend or they have a friend and maybe they might be able to get something done. But most of the time it just happens and they create a new account. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Well, it's... Uh... A scary world out there, I'll tell you. It, it is. It can it happen is. to anybody. Well, that was that was a long distance stare, Paul. Are you okay, buddy? <laughs> I am. I am. I, I, this problem really grinds my gears, though, as you can tell. Well, yeah. It, it's, we should just do a whole segment on what grinds your gears. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's the Peter Griffin segment. <laughs> <laughs> grinds my gears. This problem. This problem really. The 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 tipping point for me was that one of the cases pointed back to a, someone who worked in cybersecurity, like one of our own. That was conducting these kind of attacks, and to me, that was deplorable. Like that was, that's awful. They actually tracked them down. They didn't like fully out the person, but they yeah, they know they, who it they, is. They traced it back. They traced it back to. And hopefully, was prosecuted. Oh, I don't know if that case was prosecuted. Some some were. And usually, the ones again when there was swatting involved, right? Were prosecuted. Were prosecuted, and it wasn't. I want to say it wasn't just like one instance. It was like multiple instances of swatting that tends to really get law enforcement well yeah because attention. it's a it's direct cause and effect i mean it, it, it's a direct like line. if you're international and you've conducted illegal swatting activities in multiple states that ten, then you start getting the attention of the fbi and they go yeah all right like we'll, we'll take this case kind of thing and even if they did take the case if it's happening overseas it's and hard it's hard there's man. no jurisdictional you know, it's hard it's hard this this case i think the person the case i'm thinking of the person was in the uk well then you have treaties that would yeah and then so there's a lot more cooperation right with certain uh, certain countries over others right in a yeah, general sure. sense sure yeah and in, in in that and that's what and that's what happened and maybe they committed crimes within their own country as well so they got co more cooperation they were already I'm, on I'm the sure radar he, i'm sure he wasn't yeah. restricting his to, to the united states I'm yeah sure so they're already on the radar so like like all that stuff kind of comes together but that just means as a victim you got lucky that the person who's committing the criminal act just happens to be on the radar and there's a most of the time a motivation imagine, yeah. for both us and another country like the uk's law enforcement 
to go after that person. And it's prevalent because it's an easy thing to do and there's a very low and if likelihood they, they, they get fly caught. into the radar yeah. man and it's for for been fifteen twenty thousand dollars a hit and you can keep doing that in a you lot can make a lot some of some of the cases like these are minors committing some of these crimes as well and then you get into international laws of how you can prosecute a minor in other countries not just the u.s it's crazy Sometimes there's just no real. Yeah, you start to think answer. about things like lapses. That's where those mm, those kind of yep. uh, interesting cases start to play out. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Yeah. It's... Well, that'll round out the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching this edition of Paul Security Weekly. We'll see you next time. Over and out.